another virtual event of the Bastiat Society of Washington, D.C. My name is Steve Dewey. I'm the chapter director of our Washington, D.C. chapter of the Bastiat Society. For those of you not familiar with the Bastiat Society, it is the public outreach program of the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known by its acronym AIER. The purpose of the Bastiat Society is to educate and promote the ideals of free market economics, sound money, personal liberty, and a free and civil society. The Bastiat Society has now grown to 40 chapters around the world with 17 chapters in the United States and 23 chapters in foreign countries. And um, if you'd like to, um, uh, see more information about AIER and the Bastiat Society, you can go to uh, our website, AIER.org. Today, I am very, very excited to have Lee Schooland as our featured speaker. Lee is based in Hawaii, and she is an independent educator, writer, translator, event organizer, and Director of External Relations for the Asia-Pacific Region for the Acton Institute. And Lee will be speaking today on her incredible personal story of survival under Mao Zedong's horrific cultural revolution in China during the 1960s and 70s. Born in 1958, Lee survived the first 26 years of her life under the harsh conditions of communist China, including her first 18 years under Mao's reign of terror. Li left China in 1984 to live in the United States. As a survivor of Mao's communist cultural revolution, Li chose to dedicate the rest of her life to telling her personal story about life in a communist state and warning the rest of the world about the evils of communism. Lee has been involved with several nonprofit organizations promoting free market economics, business entrepreneurship, and the ideals of freedom and liberty around the world. She also arranges translation and publication of libertarian literature into Chinese language. So we're very honored to have Lee speak to us today. Before we start our discussion with Lee, please note that we will allocate at least 20 minutes for a Q&A uh, session with attendees uh, once Lee has concluded her presentation. Attendees will be muted throughout the course of this event, so questions from attendees will be submitted in writing, and I will read those questions submitted as they come in. And now I turn it over to Lee. Lee, please proceed. Thank you, Steve. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's early in Hawaii. I don't really uh, know where all you're coming from, but uh, thank you for uh, being here at this time. Uh, thank you for the Bastia Society uh, inviting me to share my story. So, as Steve said, my name is Lee Schooland, and uh, I am made in China. When I um, okay, uh, this is the uh, photo of my parents on their wedding day, and uh, my my father was the tallest man in the picture, and my mother was the one. Uh, in front of him. Then the one seated in the uh, armchair was my great grandmother. And uh, on the right hand side was my grandmother, my grandfather. And the one in the middle was my uncle, my father's younger brother. Uh, my great grandmother had bounded feet. Probably you heard about it. The feet was uh, very small. And uh, she married into a very prominent family uh, who was um, the Commodore of HSBC in China. So they are very westernized, but my great grandmother was still very traditional uh, uh, Chinese uh, style. 
She gave birth to nine children. My grandmother was the second of the nine, and uh, eight of the nine children were girls, only one boy. And because they were very westernized, so um, none of the uh, eight girls had bounded feet. And uh, all of them, all girls and boys, received the highest education. My grandmother went to Tsinghua University, the number one university in China, and the, my, my grandfather there. And she was the, uh, the first time when Tsinghua University changed from all boys uh, university to co-ed. She was the uh, one of the first uh, female student in that university. And uh, her, all her siblings went, either went to the best universities in China or educated in the United States or Great Britain. So it's, uh, during that time, it was very uh, unusual. So uh, this room, I have to uh, say something about this room, uh, was uh, in their um, living room of their home in Shanghai was a French style single family home with a very big uh, uh, garden. And soon after this picture was taken, uh, this room was taken away by the government and given to a family of eight, uh, six children to live in there because uh, the communist government uh, want to provide uh, equal uh, equality and fairness to all people. So my grandparents, my great grandparent, uh, my great grandmother, only three of, and my uncle, four of them don't need um, that big a, a house. Actually, it wasn't very big; just a uh, three bedroom and uh, uh, one living room and one dining room and the kitchen and the garage. So they moved a couple into the garage to live there as a home and move a family of eight to the living room uh, and one bedroom. So the house was cut in uh, into two. And uh, unfortunately, the one and a half bathroom was on the side of uh, my, my grandparents. And so the new family with, uh, of six have no bathroom. So they use uh, a chamber pot, big bucket. Uh, and they, uh, everybody shared one kitchen. And during the Cultural Revolution in 1966, and the government moved in uh, another family of three into the side of uh, where my grandparents lived. And uh, so my grandparents, uh, my by then, my uncle moved away, and my grandparents and my uh, they have one bedroom, and the other family has one another bedroom, and the living room was shared by everybody, and the kitchen was also shared by all families, and uh, this lasted until uh, late 1980s. So that's. Uh, how the Chinese uh, Communist Party provide equality and uh, sh uh, care for everybody just by um, uh, making a regulation. I think that time in Shanghai was uh, two square meters per person. That's the uh, standard. If you live, if you have a living space more than two square meters per person, then you're, you have too much. So that, that's their style. And I was born, like Steve said, uh, 1958. By then, um, my parents already moved to Tianjin. My mother went to university in Tianjin, Nankai University, studied English, and she was a top uh, student. So after graduation, they um, assigned her a job teaching English at the same university. And so my father went to medical school in Shanghai. They were a childhood uh, sweetheart. So my father moved to Tianjin to join my mother. And uh, I was born uh, 
in Tianjin, and we lived on the campus of Nankai University because all the housing was assigned by the government. Usually, is uh, where you you uh, at the same place you work. Um, my brother was born a year and a half later. Uh, as you might know, uh, uh, 1958, uh, from 1958 to 1962, uh, China had the Great Leap Forward. Uh, what Great Leap Forward uh, was, is um, Mao Zedong believed uh, China can be a world power, uh, bypass United States and Great Britain in very short time by simply producing more iron than United States and Great Britain. Then China will become the world power, economic power. So in order to produce <laughs> uh, more iron, only the uh, steel mills is not enough. So uh, he made the whole country, entire country produce uh, iron. No, uh, regardless what what your job what your uh, what you do, everybody, and so you can see from the photos those uh, little <laughs> I don't even know what call what to call them and uh, uh, burners thermos and uh, yes, furnace furnace uh, and uh, I remember on the campus of Nankai University, all the uh, sports grounds, uh, uh, football fields, all turn into uh, like the picture on the left below. And uh, um, all the trees were cut down because there's not enough coal to, to fire. And uh, then there's not enough iron ore to make. Uh, the iron. So every con every family was asked to contribute. Actually, was forcibly uh, given their uh, metal products like pots, pans, shovel, hammers, and everything made made with steel had to be turned it into the government. And all the trees were cut down to burn. And after a while, no more trees, especially in the cities. So what furnitures were taken away, tables and chairs, to burn, to melt down the ready-made metal product. And um, after it turned into a, a lump of something and they weighed it and counted it as a production of iron. So at this, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, got into power is because they uh, told the people they would take care of everybody. And uh, by taking care of everybody, it's by equally redistribute uh, all the uh, pro uh, productions evenly to everybody. In order to do that, they also um, started the, the uh, confiscated all private properties because it's not fair for somebody to own property, to own businesses, to uh, have more than other people. So only way to equally distribute everything, make everybody fair, um, is the government control all the means of production and uh, also all the raw materials, all the land, everything. And uh, they said that's the only way everybody can be uh, equal. So uh, after that, productions almost stopped because also uh, this reminds me of what's going on today um, the government start to uh, determine what is essential and what is not essential. And they believe they know better than anybody else 
what they need in their da daily lives, from food to clothing to furniture to school to every aspect of life. They determine what is essential, what is not essential, and they stop all non-essential uh, productions. For example, cosmetics is not essential. And cosmetics can uh, make some people prettier than others. That's not fair. So no more cosmetics. And only small production for uh, stage performers. And uh, also clothing. You don't need uh, clothing with decorations or colors and uh, uh, other different kind of essence on there and just simple uh, style and couple of colors. So alongside with that, other productions was um, also stalled because the focus was making iron. So my mother always feel sorry for my little brother because after he was born, there wasn't even milk or um, powder milk or milk product for babies. So just some uh, paste made of probably flour with some uh, tiny little uh, milk and sugar in there and just to fill your stomach. And uh, also there's no choice for a woman uh, um, after giving birth, how, how long they want to stay home. The government decided 56 days is good enough. So they must go back to work. And uh, my father that time was a res uh, resident in the uh, hospital. So he only uh, uh, can go home for uh, on Sundays. And uh, so my mother couldn't take care of both of us. So we were both uh, put into uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, daycare, but we couldn't go home. So boarding school, we only get to go home on Sunday, uh, on Sundays. Sometimes my mother told me after he, she picked up my brother from uh, the uh, care, uh, care center and uh, wash him and uh, feed, fed him and put him into bed and she has no energy to go there to pick me up so sometimes I won't even get to go home um, weeks um, at a time so totally grown up without my parents uh, so all this all Sundays were very special for me um, that's the only thing I can remember and uh, Immediately following the uh, Great Leap Forward was Great Famine. I don't need to explain the reason because all the um, productions were stopped and uh, um, all, a lot of uh, materials were destroyed. So, um, Great Famine followed. And also during that time, uh, China and the Soviet Union had the, uh, the relationship turned sour. And China borrowed a lot money from uh, Soviet Union. So they want to um, pretend to be a tough guy, say, okay, we don't need your help. We, and uh, pay back, uh, trying to pay back the loan. I don't know if uh, Soviet uh, pressed China to pay back early and immediately or not, but China want to be tough and uh, show off their um, power. So most, uh, and also want to show off as a big brother for the all other communist countries. So giving uh, foreign aid to uh, Eastern European countries like, uh, uh Czech Republic uh Czech Slovakia Hungary and all these countries and uh, they didn't ask for it but China say we're 
Big Brothers were giving you all these uh, uh, foreign aids, even though they have a much better life uh, standard and, uh, than China. But the Chinese government didn't think about that. They didn't think that their own people need food. So the limited productions were sent away and the people in China uh, was, were left with almost nothing. But the propaganda was there and uh, with all bountiful food and the uh, happy children, that reminds me all the uh, posters uh, today you can see in uh, North Korea. When people uh, show the posters in, from no North Korea, I, I thought that was just uh, the same, exactly the same. But the reality was people were dying of starvation. I remember, oh, I learned uh, to recognize all the edible uh, grasses on the ground, the leaves, flowers from the tree, and the, and the, because uh, food was uh, rationed by the government per person, and they decide each person need how much food, and they all these also decide you should eat either wheat product like uh, noodles or flour or rice product. And they determined uh, people live on the north of uh, Yangtze River only get wheat. And people live on the south uh, of Yangtze River get all rice. But my parents were from Shanghai. They, they love rice, but we couldn't get rice because Tianjin was uh, in the north. So my father had to uh, go through a lot of trouble to prove that he was born, his family were from Shanghai. So finally he got some quota of rice. And uh, that's just part of the grains we get and other things like uh, sorghum, millet, and uh, potato, uh, sweet potatoes and uh, corn. Uh, Cornmeals was uh, other portion, a part of the uh, food we get, all by Koda. And it's not um, just uh, grains, everything have to ration because um, it's not enough. And they decide boys will need more than girls, so girls get less food than boys, and also by age. Uh, they're very detailed because uh, also another thing is everybody have employ employment. So there's a lot of uh, uh, government jobs. They are government jobs and a lot of these things, uh, uh, they employ a lot of people to, to calculate these things. And uh, so the, all the, like I, I said earlier, everything was nationalized. Uh, my grandparents have a lot of uh, uh, factories and uh, stores and banks. They have their, uh, their families um, uh, at banks and, uh, or they have a lot of stocks. They were just, uh, at the beginning, 1950, 1951, they pay one penny per stock they're trying to buy off, but, and not everybody wants to buy. And a year later, they just say, okay, never mind, we're not paying, we're just taking it over. And the land and was earlier, was taking over. And the landlord usually was executed. Uh, one of my mother's side, uh, ancestor, they were landowners in, near Shanghai, and the whole village, everybody loved them because they're very generous. They provide uh, job opportunities, they provide food, they provide care for the whole village, and uh, everybody loved them, but the government just came in and executed her. I read yesterday, one family because they're landowners, they have uh, not too much, 
I think was uh, 80 acres of land or something like that. The family of 16 was executed at the same time. And uh, the youngest one was eight years old. Got ed ed execute, execute, executed. And uh, they put a metal wire through the nostril of the landowner like cow and drag them to drag them to the village uh, center and just uh, executed them <clears throat> in front of uh, the whole village. Just because the only crime is they own land. And uh, now when the food became so scarce and the government came with another um, strategy. They forbid people eating food at their own home. Everybody have to eat together and uh, work units or villages and have one big kitchen. Everybody have to uh, give their own the food and the, their rational, uh, rationed food and whatever edible to the uh, communal uh, uh, cafeteria's kitchen and then eat together. And the first two weeks, everybody was very happy because when they were eating at home, they know how to plan for the whole year or the whole month with uh, limited food. And uh, when once the, everybody eat together, they don't plan at all. They just cooked everything. Every day was like a feast. Usually Chinese people only have a feast, Chinese New Year and the Moon Festival, which is coming up uh, soon in a week or so. And the two weeks, everybody feasted together. And after that, nothing left. So immediately government came back with another uh, propaganda say, okay, we have to be cons uh, conserving, saving food. So let's be creative. Let's find at anything that's edible. And just like today, actually Xi Jinping just called the Chinese people to tighten their belt and uh, it's illegal to waste food. And because, uh, Chinese economy is hitting the bottom right now with the, the pandemic and also the sour relationship with the United States. So they stop uh, importing food. So China is going back towards this direction. And uh, people like me, we say this is nothing new. We know what's coming up. And also they reintroduced uh, uh, coupons for food. Uh, last year they already did for the pork. So these pictures, um, I have vivid memory already. By then, uh, 1963, I was already five years old. So I remember these. Um, I've seen people died on, on the side of the street. And the whole in the whole country, everybody was kind of uh, swollen. I don't know why, when you are starved extremely, and you, you first, be, before you turn to a skeleton, you, you, you get swollen. And uh, product, uh, productivity went down dramatically because nobody had energy to, to do anything. And uh, during that time, uh, uh, theft, uh, it's uh, become very popular because people were so starved and uh, they start to go to a uh, government kitchen to steal food. I remember my brother did even in the uh, late 1970s. They went to the uh, government kitchen and to steal a handful of uh, rice or noodles, whatever. And uh, the punishment was so, so severe, especially kids. Grown ups sometimes can, can uh, control themselves. And, uh, but kids, when they're extremely hungry and they, they saw food somewhere, 
they couldn't help to get a handful of it. And um, these are uh, the um, documented truth. And also, not every uh, place have a bullet to shoot people. So uh, bury people alive is very popular. Even when I was very young, I remember I was told why bury people alive uh, can kill them. And because when they bury you up to your neck, your heart was, uh, for some reason, you, you just have all the pressure, you couldn't breathe. And your, your, your head above the ground, you, can, you still could breathe for a short period of time, then you just suffocate it and die. And um, because uh, we're, we're, uh, our institute are close to uh, economic uh, thoughts and theories, and I, uh, so I want to talk from this perspective. And during that time, the uh, poverty level in China was much lower than all Africa countries. And, uh, the average intake of calorie per person in China was much is lower than the, the uh, average, uh, um, what do you call that, uh, intake of calorie uh, in the ostrich, the, uh, the uh, German uh, Jewish concentration camp, the entire China. And uh, some villages uh, want to show off and please Chairman Mao. So they fabricated the uh, uh, harvest data and uh, they put all the seeds, all the uh, nutrient uh, fertilizer into a very small uh, piece of land and produce very high yield of production uh, harvest. So they invited Mao to visit. Mao only saw that uh, small plot of the uh, ground and was so happy, he said, okay, this is going to be the standard for the whole country. Every farmer, every village, every piece of land have to produce this much uh, crops, uh, harvest. And his uh, word is like uh, the law. So nobody dared to say no. And also, uh, but then it is not possible because all land are not equal, not uh, suitable for same crops. Also, Mao decided uh, you have to plant rice. You cannot plant anything that you can sell, cash crops, they call it, like tobacco, uh, peanuts, uh, or anything else. So, of course, that cannot happen. And they blame the, the world. They say God didn't create a, uh, a perfect world landscape. So mountains are troublesome. Rivers are not good. And uh, so we have to move mountains, change rivers, because uh, then make more, uh, people are uh, more powerful than God. People will uh, correct God's mistake. And uh, we, um, Mao wrote uh, an essay about how a legendary man and, uh, lived in front of two uh, mountains and the mountains block his way to, to go with places. So he just start digging and moving the mountains and people laugh at him. He said, okay, I, I die, my children, my grandchildren for generations. We, if we now stop digging, the mountain will be uh, moved. And then, so he was become a, a uh, hero and model for the chi entire China, we were uh, forced to memorize this uh, essay. And uh, every day we're there out 
their moving mountains. And uh, this, I already talked about it. And all cities turn into uh, iron production uh, ground. And they, they, they uh, only produce essential uh, products and for the, for the uh, whole uh, economy. Also food, the same thing. A lot of fruit, they're luxuries. So fruit trees kind of all forbidden also. I remember one time I went to Shanghai to see my grandparents. They asked me, Shanghai had a better life and uh, asked me, what do you want? We have fruit stores. I said, I want apple. My grandfather said, what, just apple? I said, yeah, I just want to have an apple because I, I don't get to eat an apple. And, uh, and later on, we were exiled to the countryside and uh, the countryside still have some fruit trees naturally grown there like the lychee or uh, something not the uh, farm produced and only then I got to eat some fruit. Um, the, actually the, uh, the coupons for f everything you can imagine need the coupon and uh, I don't know the money they spend on design and printing and distributing these coupons it could be used very productively productively elsewhere, but we have countless coupons, uh, even sugar and salt and matches, small things, toilet paper, and to all the food and the vegetables and uh, even a uh, haircut, bath. <laughs> My friend keep asking me bath. I say, yes, you get one coupon per month for going to a, a public bathhouse because most uh, families have no facilities to take shower. Like I said, the family of eight live uh, into my grandparents' house. They, they don't even have a toilet. So they have to go to public bath and with coupon you can go once a month. And uh, even today in Chinese uh, universities, and some, when we're teaching there, the students say, oh, can we leave early today? Because today is a bath day. We, we get to go to, to get the, uh, the bath house and to take a bath. If we go late, maybe no more hot water and they close at certain hour, it, even today. And uh, the picture showed even with the coupon, it was still need to fight to, to get the food. I remember I, I just uh, in those kind of line to get a cabbage or some potatoes. Um, another thing is uh, political correctness. That's very popular nowadays in this country and not just this country, maybe in Europe and many other countries. And that's the cause of a uh, cultural revolution. And what you say, certain uh, terminologies, all the names of the street have to be changed. And uh, all the monuments uh, either take down or erect uh, for the political correctness. And even personal names. A lot of people got punished because they don't have politically correct personal names. My family, uh, my immediate family, my, my parents and uh, my brother and I, we didn't, but our cousins, many of them, because uh, they have to. They can uh, just take one word from, uh, from your Chinese names, usually can uh, have two or three, sometimes four characters. Any one characters, if they can elaborate into something like, for example, uh, something symbolized you like, you love Taiwan, or you love United States, or something like that, you're in trouble. You're imprisoned or you're executed, whatever. So uh, 
people are rushing to change names. The most popular name is uh, Protect Mao Zedong, Love China, or a soldier. I'm a soldier. That character for soldier is very popular. And my uh, generation born in 1958, 59, they, most of people have name was uh, related to uh, Great Leap Forward. Either leap or forward or leap forward. Uh, when I see those names, I know when they were born. And if you see the name of uh, protecting Mao Zedong, love Mao Zedong, you know they were born in 1960 and 70s. And, uh, and the street names, of course. And the Cultural Revolution, because it uh, reminds me of recent movement uh, in the United States. And they, they're trying to destroy everything that's not politically correct. In 1968, my father was in prison because he made a joke about uh, Chairman Mao's wife, not joke, a rumor, because uh, she, the first lady, was a movie actress before she met Mao. Everybody knew about it, but nobody allowed to say it. And uh, so my father uh, said, oh, uh, our family friend who was an um, uh, actor uh, during the time and knew about uh, uh, Madame Mao just because of that. And he was uh, put in prison of uh, counter-revolutionary. And after a year, the prison was too full. They don't have enough uh, prison to hold everybody. So he was sent to hard labor. Then. Uh, finally uh, released and then uh, they uh, sent our whole family to um, be exiled. And my mother was a professor, the students were um, uh, that uh, popular thing to do that time is to take your professor, give them a name, a uh, crime, label and uh, put a sign with their name and the, their crime on their neck and uh, march around the street uh, to publicly, publicly shame you. And uh, for women especially, they will cut your hair into an yin yang style, means they will cut half of your he head, shave half of your head, and uh, randomly cut the other side make you look like a ridiculously uh, uh, crazy person. This uh, picture shows that the right guard, the students was cutting this professor's hair. And also the sign usually made with the plywood, very heavy. And they use a very thin wire, <clears throat> metal wire to put on your neck. So because the, the sign is very heavy, so you have to bend down from the weight. And after, Days, day after day, uh, usually more than 10 hours, 15 hour a day, those wire cut into your flesh. And you're bleeding, you're hurting, so you, your head is getting lower and lower. For ch Chinese culture, when you bow your head, means you're, you're, uh, some, you did something wrong. And uh, you're, uh, so you're humiliated that way. And uh, they put you on stage a lot of times knee, kneel on a bench and your knees are really sore and you couldn't uh, keep your body straight and they can, and then they will start kicking and beating you. Many professors would die on the stage doing these kind of uh, criticized session. And uh, my mother got uh, that kind of treatment and uh, every day, was marched around the campus. And uh, all schools stopped. My brother and I had no school to go to. So I would usually go to the campus and the, on the main street to see, uh, to read the big posters because they, they have big posters posted everywhere. And uh, uh, 
renewed daily or hourly to uh, accuse people of uh, uh, made up crimes. So I would have go there to try to read to see what new crimes they labeled my mother with. Also, through that, I learned how to read because we, we had no school. And uh, another popular thing they do is called jet propulsion posture. They two men hold one uh, arm each of a person behind the back. The higher they drag your arm, the lower you, you get down. And uh, so um, that's the, another way they, they treat people every day. And uh, the sign had a lot of uh, uh, details on there. If your name have a, uh, the characters are uh, straight up means you're okay. If you, the characters was tilted or upside down, it means you have a bigger crime. If your characters have a cross on there and the even more severe, if the cross is red, means you're on your way <clears throat> to be executed. Execution was daily. Uh, I, my brother and I used to uh, climb up uh, on a wall uh, to, to uh, watch the uh, street on the other side of the wall because that's the uh, road to the execution ground. So every day truckload of people get to uh, uh, took in, uh, with, what was taken to the execution ground, we will have so-called fun counting how many people today uh, going there. And the burning all the non-correct, uh, politically correct things. That uh, another thing reminds me uh, when, the, when I watched the recent um, event in the United States. And uh, not only that, they will go to people's house to take away everything that's not uh, politically correct. The Red Guards came to our house. My father had uh, more than one pair of shoes because he loves shoes. And, uh, and uh, all the shoes were piled up and burned because they said each person only need one pair of shoes. You have so many, that's your crime. And my mother had some uh, dresses, Western style, and they, they cut into shreds in front of us and then took our family photos. And uh, they said, look at these people dressed so nicely and still have a smile on their face and uh, how evil they were. And uh, they burned all our photos. So until today, I have very little of childhood photos. So my parents, my mother still didn't care to take photos because they, we don't have anything left. And photos became the evidence of crime for us. And uh, all the antiques and uh, uh, collectibles, they knew better. They didn't destroy that mostly. They took away into a government uh, warehouse. Uh, recently, somebody reminded me, uh, Lin Biao, the second uh, man under Mao, and suggest that they have a, a show of confiscated uh, antiques and artifacts, art. So uh, in Beijing, only in Beijing, they have something really valuable of uh, antiques. And the show lasted for about two, three years uh, because this is too many. And of course, cash, gold, Definitely, it was uh, evidence of crime and uh, was uh, confiscated. My great grandmother, earlier I showed you, she, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, she was 88 years old, bounded feet. Her whole life had a very good, comfortable life. She never worked a day. Her, only her labor was uh, giving birth to nine children. And the Red Guard forced her to go out to the street to, to, uh, to weed the lawn. How to weed the lawn? Just by uh, on your knees, 
by hand pull the weed up, out from the from the grass and um, after a few days she was uh, just too exhausted and got uh, sick and died she had a very good health before Yeah, the picture with me and my brother with smile, actually, we didn't know much anything better. We were just watching, counting how many people on that, pe on that uh, specific spot, counting how many people were dragging to be executed. Then uh, from 1969 to uh, 93, we were uh, sent to the most remote uh, mountainous area in south of China and uh, no electricity, no uh, running water and uh, people still plant with uh, uh, us uh, about a thousand years uh, ago. Very primitive from the big city and uh, fortunately my parents um, we're all Christians, we have big heart. And my father and uh, five other uh, family who were exiled with us and they built a clinic to uh, help the local people. And my mother, an English professor, just uh, became my father's uh, surgery uh, helper without any training. And uh, my brother and I will hold flashlight be uh, flashlights behind my parents during the night if there's an emergency and with a fan to chase the flight away during the day when they're doing surgery. And, um, and later on, because my father was become very, very famous because he's a good doctor, he saved so many lives when their whole area has never had a doctor. And uh, so the uh, government moved us to a steel mill in a, in a small city. And he became the uh, doctor there. And my mother uh, worked in the factory um, in the, I think when, in some kind of research uh, office. And uh, I learned how to drive a tractor that's why when I came to the United States, I didn't need to learn how to drive. I already knew how to drive a tractor when I was 15 years old. That was uh, the whole family, my grandparents and my uncle and his wife have three children and my, my brother and I. When my brother was the only boy, so he get to place in the middle of the picture. How many... How many minutes, Steve, I still have? Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess you should wrap it up in uh, three or four or five minutes, and then we can okay. take some questions from our attendees. OK. Um, we, we survived. Um, not just uh, physically, mentally we survived. As I said uh, earlier, we are Christians, so we we had faith. We didn't uh, become uh, crazy or commit suicide, but um, many people, other people did. In my family, extended family, there were 11 people commit suicide because they didn't understand what happened, what they did wrong, why they suddenly became criminals. Why suddenly everything turned into that, turning in that, to that way? One of my cousins, I love her so much. She, um, when she was 15 in Shanghai, she, she was one of the most talented uh, uh, girl I've ever met. She knew all the crafts. She taught me how to do embroidery and make things. And then uh, when she was 15, she was sent to the countryside to be re-educated. And she was born, her, her parents were British educated um, engineers. They had a good life. And uh, 
she couldn't uh, handle the the hardship in the countryside. And uh, for after um, a few years, uh, the new policy was: uh, if you're sick, you get to go back to your parents. So she wasn't sick. So one day she injects some ink into her vein. She thought when uh, she can pretend her, her blood is uh, not red anymore because she had no knowledge. And uh, <laughs> of course the blood test didn't, uh, didn't turn out as she expected. And uh, she was punished because she was, they, told, uh, they said she wanted to fake illness. She just killed herself. And uh, my, my other, I have an aunt. Her husband was uh, a family, was the founder of uh, Sutran Bank, one of the first um, private bank in China. And they were punished so much and she didn't know how to handle it. So she just threw herself in front of a train. And her son tried to prove her, himself as uh, one of the good people and joined the Red Guards. And then the Red Guards started civil war, criticizing each other. And she, he happened to be on the right, wrong side. And they put him in prison and tortured. And he couldn't understand. He, he thought he was following Mao and doing the right thing. So he climbed onto a chimney in the in the prison and jumped. Before that, he he drank a lot of lime. Um, killed himself too. And um, and I I had a classmate. That time was same as me, eight nine years old. Her father was uh, uh, a professor, educated in United States and they labeled him a traitor and a spy and the big posters is everywhere with her father's name and when she saw it she she didn't understand she went home to ask her father i thought you're you're my father you're good why you're so bad you're you against the country her father said no 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 that's wrong don't trust them believe me i did nothing wrong and she she just couldn't comprehend it she said you're lying you're lying uh, I believe the government. So she started to beat her father and bite him. She's a little girl. She didn't know what to do. And the father tried to push her away and she went out the house and jumped into the uh, trench behind her apartment. She was saved. But from then on, the father just put towels uh, on, on his arm and legs, let, let the daughter bite. And my other cousin, uh, they became um, kind of crazy. I remember, uh, actually, my uncle, he, uh, one of my uncles, he, when he came to the United States, visit us in Hawaii, she was so terrified because we live in a single family home. There's no walls. And we're not in the uh, high building. He said, oh, you have no walls. This is so scary. I can't can uh, be in your house. I said, well, well that, this is our house. We can't do anything about it. Why don't you just close the window and lock the door? And uh, my husband and I, we have to go to work. Sometimes when we came home in the evening, seven o'clock, it's pitch dark. He would not turn on the light. He would sit on the very, uh, uh, the smallest uh, a stool and not dare to sit on a chair because he will be visible uh, by other people. He was sitting on a stool in the dark waiting for us and uh, because he was so uh, frightened during the Cultural Revolution and he permanently um, turned that way. So we're very very thankful that four of us, my brother and I and my parents, we were not, uh, we didn't become that way. And my father came to the United States and uh, uh, learned heart transplant. 
And because in the United States, you, if you are not uh, educated here or you are not citizen, you are not allowed to practice. So he was uh, in the uh, lab training other doctors to heart transplant. He did research. And my mother uh, is better because her, uh, she was English professor. So she was uh, hired here to teach in, uh, Chinese first at the University of Kansas and then Univers uh, Brandeis University in Boston. And my brother lives in Kansas and he is an engineer. And, uh, <clears throat> Ali, we're, uh, we're uh, uh, running short on time. We only have mm -hmm. uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. Yeah, so, this uh, is my, my uh, final statement. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, like uh, on the slide, the country can do a lot to you. And uh, so in uh, China claim to be a socialist country now, no longer communist. And many uh, politicians in this country uh, embrace socialism. To me, they're the same. It's just uh, a different name. It's a milder and uh, of uh, communism, but uh, in the in the core value, it's the same. And we we're watching our country, this uh, land of free, is moving to towards the wrong direction, and uh, that's why it uh, I have to speak out and and uh, sharing my story because it's not fiction, it's not ancient history, it's in my lifetime. It happened to me, it's, it will happen to anybody anywhere in the world if we don't do anything to stop it. Thank you. And uh, okay, this is, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about it, but you know what's going on in Hong Kong. If we don't do anything to help the people in Hong Kong, we will watch one free, one of the most free place become slave of the communism. Thanks very much, Lee. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, so we have uh, uh, three questions that have come in from our attendees. I'm not sure we'll have time to get to all three. Uh, the first one comes from Nelson. He says, um, I saw your China's Socialist God with Matt Kibbe. Do you want to talk about your introduction to freedom via the United States Constitution? Um, I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, I have one comment. You know, Constitution is important. China has a very, very good Constitution, but it means nothing. It's a showpiece. And uh, Xi Jinping changed even in that one constitution item uh, to uh, take away the term limit so he could be in power forever. So what we need to do in this country, do not make constitution to turn into a showpiece like China. Okay. All right, uh, next question here is from uh, Robert Gay. Um, do you think the current Chinese people which has seen the benefits of capitalism, um, is it, um, uh, will tolerate measures similar to the great leap forward in the cultural re revolution if the CCP attempted to enact them again? I think they're kind of. Yes, I understand. Uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party and the government benefited mostly from capitalism. They understood, they actually understood the market. They didn't think the, uh, the free market is dead. They benefit so much because they are in control of all the means of product, uh, production, all the natural resources, all the roads and, and land. So they benefit to the max, but because they are government and uh, they are not true free market, so it's not sustainable. Uh, at the same time, they're trying to eliminate all the private businesses. And small businesses, if they don't uh, have a family uh, help, they, 
they will ne never get a loan from the bank because all the bank owned by the government. And they don't give uh, small business loans to private entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, like Alibaba, uh, these big companies, uh, Chinese government have majority uh, ownership. Even uh, Disney, China, Shanghai, city of Shanghai had 50%, 51%. Uh, that's the only Disney uh, in the world. They don't own majority share. So China on, on surface right now is very prosperous, but it's not sustainable because uh, it's still, it's a capital, uh, uh, state capitalism. Okay. Um Another question here from Jonathan Chance. Um, you are a Christian. Do you see the removal of God from education as a con contributing factor in China and the United States? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in China, it's not just from a uh, from textbook or from school. It's from everywhere. Uh, Christian uh, pastor, one pastor just got eight year sentence, just be, being a pastor. And uh, uh, Sunday school is illegal in China. And right now they cannot close all the churches because they had to still uh, tell the world we have it, uh, religious freedom, but uh, they only allowed government uh, churches. The government churches uh, is, uh, they call it three self. So the Pastors, it was uh, uh, get the government, like government employees get salaries from the government and government assign them. Uh, I, I heard there's uh, a guy in the, they have a religious school and uh, he studied to be a monk, Buddhist monk. He was assigned to be a Christian pastor because, uh, oh, religion is the same. And um, I, I met the monk. He said, oh, uh, do, in school, we were uh, memorizing um, uh, book of Matthew and book of uh, Luke. We, I can memorize all of them. I knew because uh, that's our um, uh, required courses. So they were assigned a job. That's government churches. But most true Christians, they don't go to government churches. They have, yeah, uh, about 10 years ago, China was relatively open. So a lot of churches uh, opened up and a lot of uh, people studied in the United States in the seminaries and went back to China. Now they're all persecuted. They, their doors are locked. Their pastors were in, in prison. And uh, uh, Sunday school is illegal. Uh, Thai is illegal. And uh, so, yeah, I hope this country doesn't go that direction, but it seems like many little things, little aspects, and uh, it's getting towards that direction. It scares me. Yeah. Okay, uh, we just have a couple minutes uh, left. I, I, uh, I had a question for you myself, Lee. Um, I have heard from a China expert that uh, China is actually controlled by 24 families, and uh, and maybe a total of about 3,000 elite people in the elite um, that control the entire country. Do you know if that's true? Is, is that accurate? In what sense control? Control the economy or control the politics? Politics only controlled by one person, Xi Jinping. Okay, and, but I was told. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, the economy, yes, controlled by a lot of uh, prince princelings we call the second generation red we have a second generation red and second generation rich the second generation rich mostly all in the united states and uh australia and other countries second generation red half of them are outside also enjoying being rich and red and uh, one guy just this week he's a second generation red and benefited from the state capitalism, became the uh, realistic tycoon. But then because the influence of uh, capitalism and other, he has some realization of uh, seeing the, uh, the problem with the uh, planned economy and the communist uh, Xi Jinping government. So he was 
he spoke out a little bit. Now he got 18 years, 18 years prison sentence. And uh, I don't know, uh, four billion, 4.5 billion fine, something like that, a huge fine. Uh, monetary, um, you have to pay. Yeah, 18 years. It's wow. uh, just because he is a second generation, one of the families you were talking about, and said something that's not pleasing to the uh, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, he used the uh, uh, excuse of uh, anti corruption. Uh, movement eliminated all his opponent, anybody who is threat to his power. Mo all of those people were uh, government elite and uh, uh, CCP leaders, and uh, everybody's corrupted <laughs> because the power. You when you, there's power to for sale, you know people will p pay for it. And uh, all the Chinese military uh, commanders were paid for. It, it depends how much you pay the government, then what rank you will get. It's not like this country, you have to move up from your you know, experience and whatever. In China, it depends how much you pay. Mm. You pay enough, you get to be general. You pay enough, you, you become whatever rank. Mm. That's open secret. Everybody knew. But you have to pay enough and on the right side. I heard there's one guy paid enough, but happened to be on the wrong side of Xi Jinping and never get promoted. Everybody feels sorry for him. Hmm. So talking about if China and US get into war, I don't think Chinese military had a chance because uh, leadership, but China start to forbid any uh, military personnel to have vacation now. They were uh, calling everybody uh, to join the military just this uh, last week. There's oh. indication for something, yeah. Okay, Lee, well, uh, we're out of, we are really uh, reached the, our t time limit here, but um, yeah, thank you again this uh you know for taking the time uh your life story is fascinating and uh you know we, we just really appreciate uh your presentation so thank you so much thank you i hope we will uh i will awake some people and let's do something and not let this country turn to that direction that's my yes goal. absolutely absolutely right all right okay thank you everyone thanks everyone for attending have a great afternoon